Hello, welcome to the sharpening session today. Let me put the disclaimers up there on the screen. There they are, top left hand side. Uh, please read them. Uh, even if you need to pause the video to do that, please do so. Um, always important for these kind of videos that you understand that what we're going through is how we see the markets. Uh, what we explain uh, is how we've put things together. It's totally up to you to ignore it entirely if you want to, take it on board entirely if you want to, or anything in between. Now, sharpening sessions uh, we do on the weekends, mainly because that's when most markets are closed. Now, I know crypto, uh, crypto markets are still open um, over the weekends, but most other major markets are closed. So it gives us more time on these sessions for us to spend more time looking at theory understanding a little bit more about what goes on behind the scenes, how you might think about targets, how you understand the different apps that we use, how you put things together, how what, what time frames you might use, all those kind of different things. So there's many different um, concepts and topics that we talk about on our sharpening sessions. Um, now, sometimes you might tune in and watch a sharpening session and it's about something you already know, no point you're watching it. Sometimes it will help to reinforce something you already know, but it's good to hear again. Sometimes you might learn something completely new by tuning into these sharpening sessions. So hopefully you find them useful. Now, if you are watching recorded, just to show you where you can go for extra support. So you've got email addresses here. So you've got Becky at predictive.com. You've also got support at predictive.com. So you can email either one of those if you have questions. Then let me bring up this here, you can go to tradewithufos.com forward slash Becky. And I can't bring that up because my taskbar is in the way. Hold on one second. Uh, I'll bring it up and I'll show you. Uh, there we go. Hold on. There we go. Brilliant. Brilliant. So here we are, tradewithufos.com forward slash Becky. From this link, you can get different apps and platforms, some of which are free. You can scroll down, book one on one um, coaching if you'd like to. If you scroll down a bit further, you'll notice that we have our um, frequently asked questions section. So from here, it might be that the question you have, somebody else has already asked and therefore the answer is already there for you to see. It might be that the question you have is unique. Nobody's asked it yet. And by you logging in for free and asking the question there, you're doing somebody else that favor later down the line. It's also a good place uh, that we can do uh I'll kind of get our ideas from, I guess, for sharpening in that if people are asking similar questions, then that tells us people want to know that, right? People want us to go through it. So it's a really great place to post your question as opposed to uh, to email. But you can email if you'd rather. OK, so what I'm going to do, I'm going to um, make sure I can see the chat box to start with, just in case you guys have any questions or anything. Otherwise, I'm going to bring up top. And what I wanted to talk about today is probabilities versus targets. Essentially, we want to balance when we trade, we want to balance the probability of being right with what we make when we're right and what we lose when we're wrong. So essentially, it's probability versus reward to risk ratio. Those two things are correlated or inversely correlated. It would be great if the higher the probability, also the higher reward to risk ratio, right? Um, but unfortunately, it's the other way around. So there are many places along the spectrum that you could be, and there are pros and cons to anywhere on that spectrum, which is why it's your job or our jobs as individual traders to kind of understand what that compromise might be along the way, depending on how we think about the markets, how we feel about risk tolerance, how we would, would feel if we were wrong five times in a row, 10 times in a row, 20 times in a row, once, twice in a row right? All of these different things will be different for individual traders. So we need to kind of balance those things between us. So I wanted to expand on that. Now, I've done a session like this before um, a few months back. Um, but again, people come in at different times, watch different recordings at different times. Um, so hopefully this is helpful. Now, anybody that's watching live, um, I've got the chat box open there. So if you do have questions that are related to this topic, by all means, ask them. If you have questions that are unrelated to the topic, ask them. I'm happy to divert to answer your questions because you're here live and you might uh, need help live. By all means, ask me any question outside of whatever topic we're talking about. Happy to answer them and then we'll come back to this topic. So uh, feel free to ask questions either way, basically. OK, 
So let's just first clear a bit of space here and just make a little bit of a point. Let's make this big so we can we've got a nice white space that we can look at. Okay, so if we let me put that there for a second. If we think about it, let's say we place a hundred trades. Okay. Now let's say we have as a probability rate 50% probability, meaning 50% of those trades are right, 50% of those trades are wrong. 50% make a profit, 50% make a loss. Unfortunately, and it'd be great if we could, but unfortunately, we can't ever get to a 100% probability rate consistently, right? It's not, not going to happen. Unfortunately, it'd be great if we could. Even Goldman Sachs lose 10% of the time, right? So we're going to as well, we need to accept that. Now, if our probability rate, and let's, let's put this here, so probability rate, 50%, and our reward, let's do R to R, so reward to risk ratio. If our reward to risk ratio was one to one, then in the end, we would be at break even. Okay, so half of them win and you make one, half of them lose and you lose one. They cancel each other out. You might end up being actually at a very slight loss when it comes to the commissions or the spread or whatever market you're trading or whatever fees are involved in that. You might end up being at a slight loss. Overall, call it break even. So what we want to be able to do is go, if we're going to be trading, whether that's 100 trades in a week, in a month, in a year, in 10 years, however often we're trading, if we're going to be trading, how do we balance these two numbers? These two numbers are what give us our result. In fact, let's put um, result there. Okay. So we've got to balance these numbers. Now, let's say, in every case, let's just assume 100 trades, just because it's an our number. If our probability rate was 90%, but every time we won, we won one, but every time we lost, we lost two. And what would that do? So 90 of your trades lose two. So that's minus 180. 10 of your trades make one, which is 10. So either way, you're at a loss, even if you've got a 90% probability rate. We could do the maths on that. I might have got that wrong. I'm, I'm wondering if I did get that wrong. Uh, let, let's get a calculator just so I can help prove my point, right? So if you've got 90 trades times minus two, sorry, 90 trades times times two. Okay, we know that's a minus. So you've lost 180. And then you get 10 trades times one. Well, that's 10. Yeah, 10 minus 180. You're still at a loss by quite a lot. Just because you've got an inverse reward to risk ratio. So 90% of your trades being correct don't necessarily make you money. I'm, just, I'm sorry, I've just realized I've done that the wrong way around, haven't I? So actually, it's 90% of your trades are right times one. Sorry, I'm here. So 90% of your trades are right times one. So you're now 90 up, but 10% of your trades would lose. So you're still at a profit. Apologies there. The point I was trying to make, and I should have used different numbers, and we'll bring up an Excel spreadsheet in a minute to have a look at this, is that let's say, let's invert this. Let's say you're right 90% of the time, but every time you win, you win one, and every time you lose, you lose nine, you'd still be at break even. I inverted those numbers as my brain being weird there. But anyway, even if you're right 90% of the time, if your reward to risk ratio is not where it needs to be, you would still lose. So let's bring up, and I, I would suggest that you guys do this, actually. So we bring up a, an Excel spreadsheet just so we can, can do the maths for me as I do this so that I don't make a mistake just because I'm being human and my brain, for some reason, wasn't following that. We'll put it in an Excel spreadsheet, and I would suggest you guys do this and play around with it and go, OK, what's the best combination for me? And what does that look like versus what I'm already getting or whatever... Um, person is teaching me, whatever methodology that I'm copying, whatever bots that I'm using, whatever approach that I'm using, what's that currently getting versus what do I want it to be within, you know, reasonable parameters? Again, if you said I want 100% success rate at 1000 to 1, 
we all want that, uh, but it doesn't work that way. So within sort of reasonable parameters, what is that combination that you want it to be? What works best for you in that way based on your risk tolerance and things like that? And we'll talk through the pros and cons in a minute versus what is it that I'm getting or what is it that I'm learning or what is it that I'm using that's currently happening? And then what can I tweak about this in order to get this? So let's do this again and let's be much uh, clearer about what we're doing. So let me just zoom in. So let's say either way we place 100 trades. Let's say we place 100 trades, 50 are right, 50 are wrong. And let's say our reward to risk ratio is one to one. OK. So overall, the result is so this would be one and minus one, right? So that's what we use. Overall, you'd go times D4. OK. And that is equal to that times E4. So very, very simple maths. And overall, this is what it's going to be. So if you place 100 trades, 50 are right, 50 are wrong, but you're risking one to one, you've got a zero return. What if you had a 1.5 to one, right? So for every trade that you won, you made 1.5. That could be $15, $150, 150 yen, 150 pounds, 150 euros, whatever. It could be 1.5% of your account. I'm just using it as a ratio, okay? So whatever that one is to you, whether that's a currency, whether that's a percentage, whatever it is, you make 1.5 for every one that you lose and you're right 50% of the time. With an overall, out of 100 trades, you've made 25. Whether that's $25, $2,500, $25 million, whether that's 25% of your account, whatever that is. Let's assume, just to try to be consistent here, let's assume that we're talking about percentages here. So you risk 1% of your account to make 1.5% of your account. And you're right half the time. So you place 100 trades and you make 25% of your account. Maybe those 100 trades happen over a year. So you're placing, what, eight a month-ish? Again, my heart. Wouldn't trust my maths today. That's my mental maths. But I think it's about eight, eight, nine ish trades a month. Right. To, to get us to 100 in a year. So if you placed 100 trades in a year and you made 25 percent in a year, are you happy with that? Now, you might say. Mm, if I'm trading. Eight, nine times a month, that's a couple of week. It's OK. You might go, that's amazing. 25 percent in a year for a couple of trades a week. Brilliant. You might say, OK, what if I did 100 trades in a week instead of 100 trades in a year? Then I'd make 25 percent a week. Not necessarily, because what you might do in that case is increase the number, increase the opportunities that you take. But by doing that, you decrease the probability. Because what you're doing is by by default, what are the chances that 100 times more trades have the same probability? What are the chances there are that many good quality trades that exist in a week versus in a year? We've always got to be balancing something. So let's say you now place 100 trades a week instead of 100 trades a year. So that would mean in the year. So that would be 5,200, right? 52. Let's say two weeks a year you don't trade. So 100 trades a week, maybe 5,000 trades in a year. Let's say, so if this is um, as a percentage, let's do 50% and 50%. So then this is that times D2. And this is equals that times D2. You could do this manually. I'm just trying to put in the formulas to, oh, I didn't mean that. Is that D2? Okay. So then that way you could say, if I did 100 trades a week instead of 100 trades a day, which is 20 trades, sorry, my brain, apologies. If I did 100 trades a week instead of 100 trades a year, which is 20 trades a day, which is a lot, and I keep the same percentages, then I make a return of 1,250%, which is crazy. 
crazy, crazy. You might look at that and go, brilliant. But maybe this has now gone to 10% versus 90%. So overall, you're placing 5,000 trades E2, that's fine. Overall, you're placing 5,000 trades thinking, oh, the probability rate will be the same, but you're placing now a bunch more trades that don't have the same criteria. You've now kept the same reward to risk ratio as the way you put your targets, but overall, you've actually lost a huge amount. Well, you couldn't lose 3,000% of your account, could you? You would blow your account within probably a week, right? So we've got to balance these things. It can be, especially when we start trading, it can be quite exciting when we start looking at the numbers and go, oh, wow, if I did 100 trades a year and you work it out, maybe you say 45%, 55%. But wow, 100 trades a year and I'm not even right more than I'm wrong. So this is your, what you profit, right? Let's do that in green so we see that. This is what you lose. So we can see that more clearly. Do it so you might go, hold on, I'm wrong more than I'm right. I only make a little bit more, relatively, uh, when I'm right versus when I'm wrong. But just the way the maths work out, I'm still up 12.5% in a year from a couple of trades a week, 100 trades a year. Great. That does not mean that by increasing this number, you increase that number. Because by increasing this number, you probably screw with these ones, more than likely. So let's say for example, so we have three main rules that need to be hit in our trading methodology. So we have, first and foremost, has to be a confirmed climate. A confirmed climate is our first one. Our second one is that we need a an ally UFO. So we need, if the confirmed climate is upwards, then we need buy UFOs. We need that buy UFO to be a UFO envelops, right, envelops the EMA, right, on different time frames. So these are very summarized, the rules that we have. Now, we need that, let's do that on a uh, common time frame, such so as to CTF, common time frame. We need this one to be on our edge time frame, not ETF exchange traded fund, but edge time frame. And we need the EMA to come from our common time frame. So these are the main ones. And also, as well, if we have rival UFOs in the way, we might not take trades. It might be also too wide or combined UFOs together. There's always going to be extra things on top of this. But the main three rules are this. If those three rules aren't hit, we don't place a trade. Now, if you're looking to place 100 trades a week, which is an insane amount of trades, if you're looking to do that, what are the chances that there are 100 trades in a week on the markets that you trade that tick each of those three things? Probably not. You're probably having to skimp on some of the rules and say, oh, it's OK if it doesn't envelop it. If it's close to it, it's fine. Or let me look through loads of different time frames until I find one that lines up to find a UFO. Or maybe there are big UFOs in the way, but oh, it's fine. I'll just stick to these ones. I won't think about anything else. And then what you start to do is you increase that number. But these change. So like I said, just because you figure out that 10 trades gets you something. So 10 trades a week, 10 trades a day, 10 trades a year doesn't mean that times in the amount of trades by 10 times as your results by 10. Because you're probably going to, the more trades you place, the more you sacrifice probability. The stricter you are on your rules, so let's say you go, you've actually got rule one, rule two, rule three, four, five, six. The chances that something hits all six of those rules are less likely. If they hit all six of those rules, maybe they've got a 45% chance of working. Maybe if they hit five out of six, they have a 40% chance of working. Maybe if they hit four out of six, 
they have a 30% chance of working. And you see where I'm going with this. The less strict you are, the more opportunities you have because there's less things that need to line up. So it's easier to place a trade. But by doing that, you might sacrifice probability and therefore sacrifice your result. Now, for me as a trader, and we all think differently on this, but for me as a trader, I want efficiency. I don't want to increase my trades to get the same result because each trade has now become less efficient or less quality. By doing that, all I'm going to end up doing is wasting more of my time because I'm going to be placing more trades, analyzing the markets more often for the same result or for a worse result. It would have to be significantly better to justify the additional time and investment. Saying that, there are some traders that would say, almost like an addiction with the markets, right? Like they have to look at it all the time. They get itchy. They get impatient. They get, they want to be, they want it fast moving. And if that means they sacrifice probability, meaning they have less rules, so that they can increase that number to satisfy their psychological urge to trade, even if that number is lower, but still profitable, they'd rather do that. And that's fine too. To me, it's as long as that number is doable for you, can you actually place that amount of trades in that amount of time? And these numbers, so your uh, probability rate versus what you lose when you're wrong, what you make when you're right, as long as that number's doable, these numbers work out to a profit in the end. Do what you want within that. But don't assume that simply by increasing one, you increase your, your um, result in the end. because It doesn't work that way. Equally, let's say you said, OK, I'll stick with my 100 trades a year. So I won't do anything more. I'll swing trade. Couple, yeah, 100 trades in a year. Fine. But what I want to do is place my targets two to one away. You can't assume that by doing that, these numbers stay the same. You'd likely lose a bit. Uh, so that would be super fine. You'd likely lose a bit of probability because let's say your entry is here. Your stop loss is here. Let's assume you're going long. If you were one and a half away, you're there. So this is going to be 1.5. If you're two to one away, maybe you're here. Right? Two to one. Too pink for what the actual price would be. So the price has got to come in, hit the blue line, not hit the red line, move away, and hit your targets before changing again. So the further away your target, the far the price has to go in your favour before it changes its mind, the less likely that is to happen. So you're more likely to hit one and a half to one than you are two to one. You're more likely to hit two to one than you are three to one. You're more likely to hit three to one than you would ten to one. So you can't just say, oh, great, I've got a great probability rating. I'm therefore going to place my trades ten to one away. And assume that that probability rate stays the same. It won't. You're going to have less probability that that comes back in your favor. So if I show you, uh, bring up top again. So on our, with our UFOs, we have this little percentage that you'll see. You'll see that on TradeStation, you see it on top. What that percentage tells us is the probability rate of the UFOs. But probability rate versus what? Probability that they work means probability that price reacts to them, meaning if it's a green UFO, that price hits the green UFO and goes up. If it's a red UFO, that price hits the red UFO and goes down. By how much, though? So again, you can't assume that in this case, so we're looking at a two day chart of a stock, Mitech Systems, that. 58% of the time, wherever you put your targets, it's going to work. How the UFOs calculate this is in a way that's consistent um, and trackable, which is how often does price hit the opposing UFO? So if we let's look at a different market here, just just to see if we've got more 
let's try. Okay, these are closer together, so it's easier to see the, the red and, and green together. So, so let's say this one has a 48% probability rate. That means 48% of the time, price hits a green UFO and then goes to the red one. Or hits a red UFO and then goes to a green one. That's all that means. Those UFOs can be this close together, which in the case, if you were going long here, that's less than one to one away, isn't it? The blue line was your entry, the red line was your stop, and the green line was your target. Then you're making 0.6 for every one that you risk. So it's an inverted reward to risk ratio. Let's say that UFO didn't exist and it was up here. It's a one to one away. Maybe the closest red UFO was all the way up here. Right? In which case it's three to one away or whatever. So the ratio can change because UFOs are always going to be in different places. They're always going to be either close together or far away or overlapping or anything in between. So that probability rating means hitting each other. How far away that is, who knows? You'd have to test that. You'd have to track it. You'd have to see what the average reward to risk ratio is so that you can then figure out. Let's see if we can find one that's got a really high, um, really high one. I'm trying to think. OK, so this one has uh, this is the, the ES, right? So continuous futures contract for the S&P. This one has a 64% probability rate. That price moves between the UFOs. Yeah, so it hits the red, then hits the green, hits the green, then hits the red. 64% probability that that happens. We've got 64% probability that that happens, and yet those UFOs are really close together. So well, I'll bring back up my Excel spreadsheet. So it's 64%, so that'll be versus 36%. So high probability rate. But let's say you risk one and each time you're wrong, you lose three. A high probability rate, but the UFOs happen to be big UFOs and the opposing one is really close to it. So you're risking three to make one or you're risking two to make one. Or maybe you're risking one to make one. If you risk one to make one, you still be OK. If you risk 1.5 to make one, you'd still be OK. If you risk two to make one, you wouldn't be OK. So this is, again, where we need to balance those things. Now, for us, with that tool that we have on the UFOs to give us that probability rating, because we always place a target at one to one away, so risking one to make one for our first target, and then we have one further away, as long as the UFOs on average are at least one to one away, we should at least break even most of the time. Which we want to do to protect ourselves and give us room to take those bigger profits if we can, but stop us losing more often than not. If those UFOs are always really, really close to each other and they're big, then that reward to risk ratio is inverted. It doesn't matter really, even if that was 90%, you'd still lose consistently. So again, we're always exchanging one for the other. The higher the, prob the probability, most probably the lower the um, reward to risk ratio. Now, assuming this is where this tool comes in really handy, assuming that in most markets, UFOs as a ratio might be roughly the same distance away, then great, the higher that number, the better. And that will help us determine perhaps what time frames we trade, perhaps what markets we trade, keeping the reward to risk ratio the same. Because assuming most markets have similar reward to risk ratios between UFOs, the higher the probability rate, the more money you make. Great. So that helps us differentiate that. But let's say you're trying to figure out where you put your targets. We don't place targets based off of the UFOs on the same time frame. We place targets that are one to one away. And then wherever the UFOs on the bigger time frame are. So in a sense, we're kind of ignoring the UFOs on the same time frame. 
despite the fact that this probability rating comes from that. Why? Because if this probability rating is more than 50% and roughly our UFOs are at least one to one away, we know that we're going to at least break, out, break even a lot of the time. But we don't just want to place all of our trades at one to one away only and just take tiny, tiny bits out of the market. Because then you've got to be right a lot more than you're wrong. And you've got to place a lot more trades. It's inefficient. We want to take as much out of the markets as we can without exposing ourselves to a lot of risk. So we use the bigger time frame to help us with our second target. And we use the smaller time frame to find our UFO, ideally that's got a more than 50% probability rate. So coming back to our Excel spreadsheet. If you are setting your targets at simply ratios, OK, so let's say you're risking 50 pips on Forex. So you're going to let's say you do two to one. So you're risking 50 pips to make 100 pips. So you're making two to one. If you're risking one to make two, I believe you can be right. Just about if. OK, 34% of the time it would be. You can be right 34% of the time or it's 33.33333, right? Um, a third of the time. You can be right a third of the time and be wrong two thirds of the time and still make money because you're risking one to make two every time. If you're risking one to make three, you can be right 25% of the time. And therefore, three quarters of the time you're wrong and break even. So if you were right 26% of the time, you'd make money. Not very much, relatively. It's not an efficient way of trading, but you're still making money. So what this can do for some people is they say, oh, OK, if I risk one and I put my target 10 to one away, I can only be right 10% of the time and still make money. That let's play about. I can be right 9% of the time and still make money by having really far away targets. The problem with this, with all of this, none of these are right or wrong. It's psychologically what's the best thing to do. So I've had put, um, times before because I do a lot of back testing and, and teach back testing and back testing all, all the time. I've had issues before where I've done a bunch of bank testing, trying to figure out where my targets might go, where, where might be the, um, the best place for me to put my targets. And what I would have found is that, so let's go, let's make a little bit of space on this so we can make this one. I would have found that if I placed 10 to 1 trades, or if I placed 3 to 1 trades, both of them made me call it 20% a year. I don't remember the numbers, this was a few years ago. Or maybe I think 10 to 1 was, might have been 22% or something. So if you were a robot and you had zero emotions, which would you pick? Do you pick the one? Oh, is that 22%? Let's, let's have a look at these numbers. Let's, let's see. And I'll, I'll place this question to you guys. And you can think about what your answer would be. So result. This was reward to risk, probability rate, and result. Let's say the probability rate here was 15%, and the probability rate here was 55. Don't know exactly what, what the numbers were, but I'm just trying to make a point. So let's even say this was 28%. Let's give you a little, little bit more to think about. So this camp, if you placed your trades at 10 to 1 away, in this hypothetical situation and this I was left with this choice myself and I'll tell you which choice I made but what would you pick if you had 10 to ones made you more money in the end you made 28% a year instead of 20% a year or 28% a month instead of 20% a month or in whatever time period right you make more money with placing trades at 10 to 1 away but the probability rate was 15% meaning 85 trades out of 100 lose, 15 trades out of 100 win. A robot would probably pick this one. 
because ultimately a robot doesn't care if they lose if ultimately you get the right result they don't feel the losses they just do it knowing that statistically it's going to work out well they don't think that way right they just do it as a human being how do you feel being wrong 85 percent of the time not necessarily for an ego reason but i mean taking a loss once twice three times four times five times six times seven times eight times maybe nine times ten times because it doesn't work out that 1.5 of your trades would be wrong out of 10. You might have 20 trades that are wrong in a row and then two or three that are right to give you that average percentage. The lower your probability rate, the more likely you are to go through a lot of losses at once. How do you feel about that? Does that affect you? Does that bother you? Do you care? Would you still be motivated to get up in the morning and press press the button to trade if you just lost nine times in a row? What does each loss represent to you? If each loss is 20 bucks, how do you feel if you lose 20 bucks three times in a row? Maybe you don't care. How do you feel if you lose 20 bucks 10 times in a row? Maybe you don't care. How do you feel if you lose it 20 times in a row? Maybe you do care. And all of us are going to have different answers to that because money means different amounts of amounts to us. We're more risk tolerant, less risk tolerant. We'll all have different answers. There will be some people, I would say few from my experience of traders, few that would say I wouldn't care however many times I was wrong in a row if by the end of the year I still was at at a profit I'll go with that the reality is most people would probably do better with this because they're right more than they're wrong and they might make less by the end of the year so you might say right I sacrifice eight percent in the year and all right compounded over many years that might make a big difference but what do I gain I gain vanity right I'm not losing consistently many times in a row after each other very often overall more right than I'm wrong which means it's easier for me psychologically to continue to place the trades which means I'm actually more likely to get that result because I'm actually going to stick to it If you're losing a lot in a row and you go through a bad run, how likely are you to stick to it? Maybe the bad run really hurts your account. It's actually quite hard to recover from that. Maybe you miss because you're busy, because you're sick, because you're on a plane, because you're whatever, your internet's gone down. I'm currently in a different place uh, today than I would be normally because we've had a storm in the UK and at my house I have no electricity and no Wi-Fi. So I've had to go somewhere else. If those things happen in real life, and you miss the odd trade that comes along that gives you a decent profit that helps you offset the last nine losers and you miss that, how does that affect your account? Whereas if you miss a couple of good trades here, it won't hurt you so much because you're likely, slightly more likely than not, to get a winning trade on your next trade anyway or on your next few trades, definitely. So you're constantly we are constantly exchanging one for the other and we need to understand the extremes of that when I first started trading maybe for the first few years I didn't really understand the psychological impact of being wrong consistently I thought as long as in the end you follow the rules you keep doing it as long as in the end you get the biggest percentage that you can great but it, it doesn't It doesn't work that way in real life. And for most traders I know, I think they would agree it doesn't work that way in real life. We need to be able to see this in such a way where we understand the pros and cons of both and understand where we fit. You might be somebody that says, if we go back over here, you might be somebody that says, I couldn't be right more than three times in a row. Well, then you probably want to have 60-70% probability rate that means for you to get a 60-70% probability rate you probably need to be taking your profits closer to you so you're more likely to be able to just take a little bit take a little bit take a little bit take a little bit lost a little bit fine take a little bit lost a little bit fine take a little bit take a little bit take a little bit the downside of that is you will miss that would be 30% you will miss the big runs 
you might place trades where you're right and it goes 25 to 1 and you're nowhere near it. You took 1%. That will be the frustrating thing. The plus side will be that you are taking profits regularly. Averagely, over 10 trades, three of them will be wrong. Don't wrong. You will have times where five out of 10 will be wrong and the next 10, maybe one or two will be wrong. But averagely, over the course of trading over months, three out of 10 trades are wrong, but the rest of them are profitable. Great. If that makes you more comfortable, brilliant. But you have to be OK with the fact that you're going to miss out on the big moves. To me, again, it's more about the balance. I wouldn't want to place trades that are one to one, because for me, what that does is that pressures me to have to be right more often than I'm wrong. And I, I might be anyway, depending on what I'm trading and what time frames I'm using, if I'm investing, if I'm shorter term trading, all of these things are all variables that change it. But I personally want to be risking more than what I'm sorry. I want to be making more than what I'm risking. So that might mean that I have a 40 percent probability rate. But if I'm risking one to make two. I'm still profitable and this isn't too skewed that I'm wrong all of the time. Right. Or I'm wrong most of the time. A huge majority of the time it's just slightly there ideally what we want to do is learn over time apply different things and creep this number up whilst keeping that the same or creep this number up whilst keeping that the same but we have to test things we have to try things we have to keep keep learning and keep adapting with with what we're doing in order to do that we can't just say these are the numbers, let's say 40% at two to one for 100 trades. So times that by 10 and times that by 10 doesn't work that way, because by changing that, you probably change this. Equally, by changing this, you probably change that. By changing this, you probably change that. So we need to back test and go, OK, if my strategy at the moment is 40% at two to one. That's what I'm getting now. What could I do to increase the probability without sacrificing the reward to risk? Could I look at different markets? Could I coming back to top? Could I only look at markets where this number is a certain percentage? Could I add in layers of probability? What that might do is decrease the amount of trades you can place. So maybe you then have to look at more markets. So for example, let's say this is you looking at just the euro dollar, making that oh, euro dollar. And this is what you get. And you add in more layers, more probability. So instead of three main rules, you have four. Instead of six, you have eight. Instead of 10, you have 12, whatever. You increase your strictness in terms of the amount of criteria that needs to be hit before you place the trade. And that's only looking at the euro dollar. What that does by going from, let's say, four rules to six rules is that you reduce the amount of trades you can actually place. So maybe you increase that. But you've reduced that. So just to show you, 100 trades at 40 percent was 20 percent return. If you have 70 trades at, say, 45 percent. Oh, sorry. Uh, did that wrong? Let's go back. So 100 trades at 40 percent gives you 20 percent. 70 trades at 45 percent gives you 21 percent. So you're slightly higher. You might go, actually, great. By doing what I'm doing, I place less trades. I have a higher probability rate. I make more money. But maybe that actually drops it to half the amount of trades that you can do. So then the amount of money you make is less. So then maybe instead of just looking at the euro dollar, you look at the euro dollar and the pound Canadian. As an example, right? You add another market so that you can come back to this number being what it needs to be whilst applying the same strategy that got you these numbers where you want them to be. 
So there's so many different variables here. So if we um, delete this for now, in fact, let's go back to top to do this. So many different variables here that we need to bear in mind. And these are all the things that we need to balance of trades. We have amount of markets, as in, if you're trading futures, are you trading just oil? Or are you trading oil and natural gas? Are you trading oil, natural natural gas, um, the S&P, the ES, the NASDAQ? Are you trading currency futures? Are you trading corn, wheat, silver? You know, however many of the futures markets there are, how many of them are you trading? By increasing that, and this is something we need to make bear in mind, by increasing the amount of markets that we trade, that obviously increases the amount of capital that you need and margin that you need to place them. Also, might if you're placing many trades at once, might increase your risk, especially in a um, a world where everything's so correlated. Something happens in one market, it might affect another. So that's a variable that has pros and cons for both sides. If you're only trading the euro dollar and that's all you trade, and in this period of a couple of months, if that's your bread and butter. The euro dollar goes a bit weird because something happens between the European Union and the States or something happens just in one of those places or something to do with trade or something that affects that market makes it do things that are outside of the ordinary, which is what you've made your money on. Well, you're screwed if you don't trade any other markets. If you trade 20 markets. Well, you're hedged. If something goes crazy in one of them, you've got 19 others that are acting normally. Um, or maybe some of them are correlated and they have a little bit of a problem. But by trading more markets, you're more hedged. But you need that much more capital and that much more margin available to be able to place the trades. Pros and cons on each side of that scale. You've got to find where we sit in the middle. So we've got amount of markets, we've got amount of trades. That's capital. Big thing to say. Amount of trades. Are you placing 100 trades a week? That's a lot of trades. Are you placing 100 trades every 10 years? Placing 10 trades a year. That will change your profitability. Not necessarily, by the way, the more markets or the more trades equals the more money. Actually, sometimes it's the opposite. The less markets you trade, the less trades you place, the more you make. Sometimes it can be the other way around, but we've got to balance these things out. We've got probability rate. Probability of whether or not you're profitable. We've got reward to risk ratio. These four main things equal your result. And by changing one of them, you probably by default has a knock on effect to the others. So let's say you're trading in a certain way and it's making you money and you go, I want to make more money. I'm going to increase that. Don't expect that you're just going to increase it by the ratio that you think you will. <laughs> uh, I've tried it, trust me, it doesn't work that way. Understand that if you're going to change one of these variables, you might change the result. So the answer to that, as far as I'm concerned, backtest it. By backtesting, you go, OK, let's say all of these things, let's give it uh, value. So let's say you trade five markets, you trade 10 times per week. Oh, let's do that in the same place. You trade 10 times per week. You have a 40% probability. Let's do this really easy maths for me. 50% probability at two to one. And that means overall, by the way, you've also got uh, risk, as in the amount of percent that you risk, other variables as well that go into this, but uh, let's just keep it more plain for now. And let's say all of that in the end gives you a result. I'm going to make up this number, okay? Let's get, say that gives you. $250 per week, okay? Making up the numbers. Then you say, hmm, what if I increase that? What if I decrease that? What if I increase that? What if I increase that? 
But if I try different things where I put my targets in different places or I put more rules on or less rules on, what if I increase this or decrease that? Back test it and you'll get the answer. Don't, I would say this in trading in general, don't assume anything. Be guided by the data. Let the proof be in the pudding. It's an um, English phrase, right? If you prove through backtesting that by increasing the amount of trades you place, you increase your result because it might change these a little bit, but not very much. And you prove that that works and that, that makes you more money, then do it. But don't assume it's working as it is now. Therefore, increasing the amount of trades will increase my result because you might affect the other variables. If you're assuming that, I don't know, you might think, based on what I've said as well, that by trying to get that number up, you reduce that number significantly and it's not worth it. That might not be true. You might double the reward to risk ratio, but only lose 10% probability and therefore make a lot more money. They don't work in that ratio between each other necessarily. It's not a, a one for one kind of thing. So test it. Don't assume it will work or that it won't work. Test it. The more we backtest and the more we demo trade and the more we practice, and backtesting is great because it allows us to do that in the past, right? We can do it in with data that's already happened in trading that's already taken place rather than doing it from now into the future and waiting years for the results. By backtesting, we should all come up with different strategies, different things that we do, different markets that we trade different amounts of trades that we place, different times of day that we do it, different methodologies, different apps, different platforms, different probability rates, different reward to risk ratios, different indicators that we use. All different. I don't think there are two traders in the world that trade exactly the same way, and they shouldn't. We should go down these rabbit holes where we play with these numbers and we find something that works for us. Not just works for us in terms of the result, but it works for us in terms of how we feel about the amount of trades we take, the time we have to do that, how often we're wrong, how many times we miss out on a big move, how many times we take small profits, how many times we take small losses, how many times we take big losses, what that means to us overall, what the amount of money means to us, what the percentage means to us. All of those things make us different as traders, which means all of those things make it different in the way that we apply our trading. We should all trade differently. Even if we have the same methodology, but we tweak the things around it, or we trade the same markets, but we trade a completely different methodology, or we place the same amount of trades and we have the same probability rate and same risk and reward ratio, but we do completely different things. Fine, it's okay if that happens. Our job as traders is to find the thing that works for us. And to me, the only efficient way of doing that is by back testing and playing around with these different things and getting to that result. Now, one thing as well to, to be aware of is that when we are first starting, we tend to copy what people tell us, right? Or we use bots, we use robots uh, nowadays, AI, that can do a lot for us. Now, the good thing with using bots, AI, apps that, that we use, technology that does a lot or all of it for us, the good thing about that is that that means that the how we feel about being wrong bit kind of comes out of it how we feel about it because we're not looking at it anymore right something else is doing that for us and that's great however my thing with using ai and using bots like everything has got pros and cons what if by using that robot it works for a couple of months and then it doesn't and you don't know what it's doing you don't know if the robot's malfunctioned. You don't know if the markets have changed. You don't You don't know. You haven't backtested it yourself. You haven't seen the numbers. You haven't seen the data. You don't know if that's a normal blip or if that's a, it's not working anymore, right? Are you paying for the bot? Is it free? If it was free and it consistently made everybody loads of money, would it, would it still be free for very long? If you're paying for it, that doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be working consistently. Maybe it only works in uptrends. Maybe it only works in downtrends. Maybe it only works when the market doesn't really know what it's doing. 
back testing, I come back to this all the time. Back testing for yourself and understanding this for yourself, yeah, it's a bit more effort than just letting a bot do it for you. But it gives you more control over it and more understanding. If things don't go very well, you know better what to do about it. For me, I, I tend to be a uh, what would be the word? I sit in the middle <laughs> of of a lot of things. Doing a bit of both is probably not a bad idea, right? Same as going full out this needs to be 90 percent and therefore I'll risk 10 to make 1.5 that's an extreme way of doing things equally I'm going to risk one to make 20 which means that's gone down to four percent or whatever that's an extreme way of doing things finding somewhere in the middle is probably better for most people going I'm not going to understand any of this. I'm not going to put any effort or any time or any money or any anything into understanding this myself or playing around with it myself or looking through the maths myself. If you're thinking that way and just going with the bots, that could go really well for you. It could end up going really badly for you. You might not have any any understanding or anything you can do about it. The other side of going, I'm never going to use technology. I'm just going to use my eyes to look at maybe a couple of indicators or whatever, and I'm going to do it all by myself. You might be in situations where you're exposing yourself to the psychological element of trading a hell of a lot more than you need to be to the point where it affects you a lot and you can't trade very well. You might by life not be able to place trades because you were busy or whatever that you miss the trade of your life. So there's pros and cons to both. So maybe you do a little bit of automated trading and maybe you do a little bit of trading things for yourself. But in either case, whether you trade things for yourself and you analyze the market yourself or you use a bot or an AI thing or whatever, or both, try to understand it and understand what ratios are going on here. What's going on? You might be able to learn from the bot. It's got a 60% probability rate at 10 to 1. How? (laughs) Right. What's it doing? Let's learn. So that if for whatever reason I can't use that bot anymore, I can replicate the results. Or if your results are better than the bot, then you might go, well, maybe I'll try and program my results into something, whatever. Use a bit of both. Either way, understand, take these off for now, um, understand the main things that are contributing to your success or failure as a trader, which is mainly going to be these things as well as the methodology that you're using. How can you tweak the methodology? How can you tweak the rules to get these things still lined up to improve your result? How can you do that in a way where you don't risk anything? Back test. So I know we started off this session, uh, I was bad with my maths there, apologies on that. Um, My brain wasn't working very well, but hopefully we just come back to, um, back to here. Hopefully what we've explained and going through the numbers and going through the pros and cons of each has helped you to go, hmm, I'm probably more of, I don't know, this person. Or maybe I'm more of this person or whatever, right? Where Wherever you are on the extreme, somewhere in between, that then helps you to say, okay, maybe I'll pay, place my trades between here or here. Maybe I'll back test adding this or taking that away. Oh, I wondered why when I increased my amount of trades, my results changed. So overall, hopefully this has given you things to think about, things to test, things to back test, things to put into practice to help figure out for yourself what those combination of of factors works best for you. And then you can go from there and hopefully ever improve and increase uh, your results. If you have questions. Go to, oh, it's already there, tradewithufos.com forward slash Becky, which will take you here. You can get different apps and platforms. You can get one-on-one coaching. If you scroll down, you can log in for free, post questions here, which we'd prefer rather than you email us just because it makes it public. Other people see the questions. Other people see the answers. If you don't feel comfortable doing that, then you can email me, which is becky at tradictive.com. 
Otherwise, guys, I think we're pretty much towards the end of the session. So let me know if you uh, need any help. Again, apologies for the confusion at the start of the session. But hopefully the rest of it was helpful. And I will be back in a couple of weeks for the next one. So I'll see you soon. Take care. Bye bye.